Welcome to you all. My name is Muhammad Khalil, and I'm the director of the Muslim Studies program here at Michigan State. Welcome to this special event entitled American Period, Muslim Period. The remarkable stories of Talat Hamdani and Richard McKinney. And their stories are indeed remarkable. The purpose of this event is quite simple. We would like to share stories that maybe we don't typically hear, or if we do hear them, maybe they are often drowned out by other voices. Our first presenter is Mr. Richard McKinney. Mr. McKinney is a retired veteran, joining the Marine Corps in 1986 and retiring from the Army in 2011. He has traveled the world, setting foot on every continent except Antarctica, and he told me, unfortunately, fighting in several of them also. He has an associate's degree in criminal justice and is at Ball State University finishing his bachelor's in social work with a minor in peace and conflict resolution studies. He is also the former president of the Islamic Center of Muncie, Indiana. And when I was in Muncie a few months ago, he was the person giving the announcements after the Friday prayer. And I remember him telling the congregation that they had to do a better job of making the entrance look good. And this might come as a surprise when you hear what he's about to tell you. His story was recently featured in USA Today, and we're delighted to have him here with us. Please join me in welcoming Mr. McKinney. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm very humble to be before you tonight. Um, love your campus. I really do. This is uh, looks like a stun gun. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, want to, I want to begin by reading you a newspaper article, okay? The headline is, Local Islamic Center Destroyed, Over 100 Dead, Veteran Blamed. On Friday afternoon, a local Islamic center was leveled, all those inside confirmed dead. A veteran suffering from PTSD is in custody. He is being held without bond on several federal charges, one of which is mass murder. Now that's about somebody I used to know. I no longer know that person because that person's me. I stand before you tonight a Muslim. I had such a hatred inside of me. I, I used to term it as, as a separate organ. Um, and we all know that we don't want to just lose an organ because we would die. But my hatred is what kept me going during that time. Don't really know what started, whether it was the military or whether it was being overseas and fighting against people of, of that faith, or so-called. But I felt such a desire to eradicate what I refer to as a cancer. I refer to Islam as a cancer. Because I saw it doing nothing but harm to everything that I was about, that everything of my society was about. But we all get like that a little bit. Because we forget to turn off TV. And we watch things like Fox News, CNN, and we base our opinions on the media and people within the media, pop stars, athletes, movie stars, because what they say matters. We don't have it in us to search for something else, to search for something that is a deeper meaning than what we just get off the surface. You know, when you dig for gold, you don't just skim the dirt off the top. You won't find anything. You have to get underneath, and you have to go deep to find the meaning of what Islam was really about. Let's get back to my hatred a little bit. I grew up inner city, Cincinnati. I was in grade school. I was in grade school back in the 70s was actually part of desegregation from the final stages. And I, was, I remember being the only white kid on my school bus. 
I grew up in an all black neighborhood. The kind of school I went to. And being from that neighborhood, of course, being a, a boy, wanting to be outside and playing, I remember playing with some of the kids in the neighborhood. My grandfather, now I'll forgive him, but he was racist. Why he moved to that neighborhood, I don't know if that's what he felt, but I remember getting in trouble for playing, playing with the black kids in the, in the neighborhood. There was no one else to play with. But I remember something he said, or it came back to me, and I want you to remember this because it'll come back later on in my story. I don't want my family around those people. You ever hear that before? Those people, right? So that's going to come back. Anyway, I went on, joined the Marine Corps, didn't have a lot of options open to me, was expelled from a high school, never did graduate high school, got a GED when I was in Japan. I was selling $2 joints out of my wall locker, got caught, got expelled. Marine Corps took me, I owed them a lot, they saved my life. Because I would probably be dead or in prison right now if it wasn't for that. Ah. But as I went on, I needed something to hate. I needed an enemy. I needed something to look towards that was less than me. Eventually, I found it. Muslim. I remember one time going to a shoe store, DSW, and going into the store with my wife, and there was two Muslim women there, full black burqa. I found a chair and I sat down and cried. My sadness came because I prayed for enough intestinal fortitude to do harm to those ladies. Because I didn't want them around me. They didn't need to be there. They didn't need to be here. So I culminated this plan, and for legal reasons I can't discuss the materials that I had. But I culminated this plan, and when, when I put it together though, I told nobody about it. It was all me. I was going to do one last thing for my country. Because I knew I'd get caught. I'm not a mastermind criminal. And with today's forensics, just don't get away with stuff like that. And I knew I would end up probably in Terre Haute Federal Prison with a needle in my arm. I didn't care. At that point, I shouldn't have been alive anyway. I'd already faced that part of my life many times overseas and made it out. Because I believe I still had one left, one more thing to do for my country. Didn't know what it was, but I found out. The local Islamic center there in Muncie, of course, I, you know, meets every Friday for Juma prayer. And I had devised a plan to put together an IED and stick it in the back of the building. Dial the number in during the prayer time and just watch it go up. I was close. But something had happened to me. My daughter came home. She was seven. And she was telling us about this little boy she sat across from at her elementary school. And his mom came to get him to pull him out of class. When she came in, she was dressed. He jive, long robe. And when she told me that, I just started blurting out. I don't want my family around those people. And at that point, a light bulb came on. I was spewing the same ignorance that my grandfather had spewed to me years ago. Those people. So even 
though I'd had many interactions with Muslims, at that point none of them really being any good, I decided I'll give them one more chance. So I went to a Friday prayer. Didn't tell anybody I was going. I walked in and, and I had walked in the front door. As soon as I did, I looked at these clocks and I said, what's up with these Muslims? And they can't even tell time. They got all these clocks. I look over to my left in the shoe room and there's a gentleman there. He looks up at me and I look at him and he knew I didn't didn't necessarily belong there, or I was lost. I'm going to help you. I want you to teach me about Islam. He said, well, do you have a minute? I said, i got two hours. He says, okay, we'll give it a shot. <laughs> so he takes me in, sits me down in the back of the prayer room where we had some chairs, and um, hands me some literature, which, of course, I was just back there going, man, ain't this a bunch of propaganda. Look at this. The sermon started. Wow. This Islam thing sounds pretty good, man. This guy up here, he knows how to talk. This is a good message. And afterwards, we uh, went into the library. I got hooked up with a, a guy closer to my age. And sat down and he handed me a Quran. And I, of course, did not tell them my plan. I said I was just in there wanting to learn a little bit more about Islam. And me Quran, he says, he says, here. He says, we can sit here and talk for hours. Take this. Read it. When you have questions, come back. I said, all right. Before I can move, this older gentleman comes up, sits down at my feet, and hugs my leg. And starts crying. Now, I'd already been introduced to this gentleman and found out that he was a doctor. And the thing about American society, especially when you're, when you're all, in, you know, part of, part of the hierarchy of the society, you know, you see people, you know, doctors, professors, you know, uh, there's a hierarchy. There's, there, there's, a, there's a, like a chain of command almost, okay? These people are better than these people. So you have your doctors, your lawyers, your professors, and way down here you have attorneys, but <laughs> under your murderers and stuff. But, <laughs> sorry if there's any lawyers or one of you lawyers out there, but I've uh, been divorced, that's how I feel. Anyway, <laughs> so I did. I read it. I came back and I asked questions. Within eight weeks, I had went from having almost everything I needed to blow this place up to taking shahad. And people are like, well, wow, man. How does that happen? <coughs> well, I can stand in front of you today and tell you I don't have a clue. It just did. God, Allah, made it that way. I tell people, I had to be here before I could be here. Because of the way I was raised, especially in my adult life, to, or from my lessons from the military, being all machismo and being tough and everything like that, I had to come from a place of such power to a place of surrender. And once I surrendered, I found out that's the power. The hatred's a waste of time. You, nothing good comes out of hatred. Nothing good has ever come out of hatred. I mean, anybody here that's a history, uh, history major can tell you that. Nothing has ever good, nothing ever good has come out of hatred. Never. And being from the Midwest, the only thing we have to hate is the New England Patriots. I know that's wrong, but I really do hate those guys. Uh, so I took on this cause and this lifelong pursuit of redemption. 
Now, once I took Shahada, Allah released all those symptoms. I believe that. But there's a personal level of redemption I had to go through. I hurt a lot of people. Some of those people I hurt will never see their families again. I own that. But it drives me. It drives me to do things like I'm doing here tonight. See, because I use words. Only in certain settings, of course. But I use words like jihad. I consider myself a jihadi. I consider myself a mujahideen. Because that's the direction I'm going. As Muslims, we're not here to destroy the world. We're here to make it a better place. We're here to stand up for those that can't stand for themselves. And I'm here to tell you, after all the stuff I've been through, all the stuff I've seen and been a part of, that's power. That's toughness. To take the call of someone else can't do it themselves. That's true power. Now, getting back to a little bit about feelings of hatred. We all say at one time or another, man, I hate this, or man, I hate that. Or, I hate the way they act. Or, But we say that not knowing exactly what it is we're saying. It's a feeling. We're representing a feeling. We're representing the first thing that comes out of our mind. And we project that on others. Stopping our hatred and our misunderstanding about each other should be our first priority. You know, I've done a lot of uh, a lot of work about trying to cut down the cultural cultural blinds between men and women. I've done a lot to try to try to peacefully put together Shia, Sunni, Sufi, Muslims. You know, because there's there's actually a famous saying that the only difference between you and me is as thin as it's fine in the sand. Supposedly, I was said to a Christian from a Muslim. Why is it Muslims can't say that to each other? I don't know. I don't talk a lot about my military time, not in an open form. If anybody wants to ask me more of a one-on-one -on -one question afterwards, where I've been, who I was with, or whatever, I'll be more than happy to answer that afterwards. But in my planning of what I was doing, like I said, nobody knew about it. My wife did not know about it. My wife did not know about it until the FBI came to the door, followed by the bomb bell. And that almost caused that to me. For some reason, she's still there. She says she's smart. I don't know. But we live in a time where ill feelings towards one another is in style. It's in style not to like somebody. It's in style not to hate, or to hate somebody. And that comes from our leaders all the way down, including he who shall, shall not be named. Take a little off Harry Potter there. And that's what we're taught. And that's what we're projected towards. And it's okay. But we have to ask ourselves, is this truly the way I want to live my life? As an American? As a Muslim? I got to experience a little bit of, I guess, racism firsthand when I was a Muslim. I went to a Walmart after a Juma. And those of you who have a better understanding will totally recognize this. But I had all my kufi and I had a long white throw on. And I remember I had to pick something up before I went home. But ain't thinking I had all this on, right? 
So I go into Walmart, mind my own business. Something about the whole experience, just, I felt, I guess uh, my spider sense was changing. Something was wrong. Something was up. And I went on about my business. I just got stuff and I'm standing in line. And I said, what is going on? I look around, people were staring at me, going. I was like, oh, that's what that feels like. Man, I, I didn't like it because, you know, if I was not to have this robe on right now and have a short sleeve shirt on or whatever, you'd see all my tattoos and you'd see I was, I was a veteran and, you know, but I have this on, so you judge me by this and not what's underneath. See that? You see? Does that make sense? If we, did, we judge these sisters over here. They wear a hijab. Anybody ever ask them why they wear a hijab? Mom and dad make them wear a hijab? Is it a fashion statement? No, you just see them with a hijab and you're like, oh, there's a Muslim bro. I, mean, I, 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 I When I say this, I'm not really directing towards anybody in the audience. I'm just speaking to the general society. So I don't want anybody to be offended by that. But, like I was. I was judged by my appearance. And not for what was underneath. Not my story. Not what I did or had done for, for this country. And that's the way some people like to put it. I have a, a take on that. We have to remember, as Americans, especially as Muslims, we are no better than the person to the right, to the left, to the man, to the woman, to the child. We all have our place. We're all guided, even for those atheists out there. We're all guided. You don't have to believe in God. You don't have to believe in Allah. You don't have to say your prayers. That's your choice. The Constitution didn't give that to you. God gave that to you. It's called free will. That was around long before the Constitution. Think about that. I see a lot of people with a lot of looks on their faces tonight. I hope that means you guys are generating some questions. Um, and I hope I can give you the right answers. I really did a Cliff Notes version on this tonight, because usually when I speak, I speak for like an hour. So I kind of chopped it up. So you'll have to excuse me on that. I am very sorry, but I'm only giving 20 minutes to a half hour. Uh, basically because I wanted to allow the sister to talk and I want you to have plenty of time with your questions. Anyway, with that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McKay. And now for a different kind of American Muslim story. Our next speaker is Ms. Talat Hamdani. She is the mother of Muhammad Salman Hamdani, a 23-year-old New York Police Department cadet an EMT who sacrificed his life trying to save others on 9-11. His story is an amazing one. Some of you might recall Representative Keith Ellison of Minnesota tearfully recounting Salman's heroics on 9-11 before the House Committee on Homeland Security. He wept openly as he told the story of the suspicion and innuendo that the media published hinting that Salman was somehow involved in the attacks even as his family endured the unspeakable pain of a fruitless search for him. His remains were eventually found in the rubble of the World Trade Center, and his heroism was recognized officially by the United States government. I had the privilege of seeing the street named after him when I was in New York last year, and you're going to see a picture of that in a moment. Now, Salman could not have asked for a better mother. Ms. Hamdani is a tireless activist for human rights and interfaith understanding. She is an educator, and she talks about her son whenever she speaks in public. And although it's extremely difficult for her to do this, she regards this work as essential. And she has been honored accordingly, receiving various awards for her important work. 
Please join me in welcoming Ms. Salat Hamdan. Assalamualaikum everybody and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I met him last year for the interview in New York and uh, it's a privilege uh, to speak at your prestigious campus. Uh, it's been 16 years since the event that landed as it happened and the topic today is, of course I'm very, uh, I want to thank the Muslim Students Association also because you are all doing a very good job and the future of this country rests in your hands. So the, the, so the, term, the topic today is uh, America, American and Muslim, right? American, Muslim. So who is an American? In my perspective, the American, the true American, is the red Indian. When the settlers came here, the Red Indians were the, to this day they are recognized as the true Americans. And do you know what the percentage they are right now? 0.9% of total American population is the Red Indian race. So 91.1% are all of us settlers and immigrants from different continents, Europeans, Asians, from Middle East, from South America, from Africa. So this country belongs to the, to the America, to the immigrants. And that is a very important fact to understand. And never forget, especially in, in modern times. So we are a people of diverse nations, diverse cultures, diverse ethnicities, diverse religions, and diverse languages. And what binds us together? The binding glue is this country, this land, the United States of America. That is what binds all of us forever. Whoever comes here, comes as an immigrant and we all blend in. I wouldn't call it the melting pot because we do have our individuality. The, the American, the core American values that, see, we do not have uh, the Islamic state of America or the Christian state of America. It's just the land, you know, the United States of America. And the core values that bind us together are equality, mutual respect, diversity, tolerance, work ethics, our individualism, the accomplishment of the American dream, and love of the land, that, you know, the United States of America. And as stated in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be sacred, that all men are created equal and independent, that from that equal creation, they derive rights inherent and inalienable, among which are the preservation of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And accordingly, the First Amendment, the Congress, it states, the Congress shall make no law respecting establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech and other free speech and no, freedoms. And the 14th Amendment guarantees equal protection. So America is the land of Christians, Jews, Hindus, Muslims, Jains, other religions, and atheists. There is our, you know, Except that is what I call our exceptionalism. And the pilgrims came here in 1620 escaping, 
uh, religious persecution from the British and 400 years, almost 400 years later, who have we become? We have become the, we are prosecuting the Muslims here. We have transformed into who we did not approve of and left that land, the settlers. And today, 400, almost 400 years later, we have become the oppressors, the religious oppression. So we, are, we have become a society of society which is racked with racism, xenophobia, bigotry, prejudice, hatred, and Islamophobia. A society that really said revels in scapegoating the Muslims for the 9-11 attacks. They are holding all the Muslims responsible for those terrible terrorist attacks because of collective guilt, because we are all Muslim. And that is what I object to, because I lost my son that day. No one talks about that the Muslims died that day also. No one. We are the others, as he said, as Richard said. We have become the other, the target to hate after 9-11. On 9-11, it was a beautiful, Tuesday morning, crystal clear. Uh, Salman lived at home, and I went to work with my younger son at 7.15. Salman used to leave at 8, 8.30. I went into the classroom, and I remember telling Zeeshan, it's a crystal clear, beautiful morning. It was a Tuesday. And I'm sure all of you remember where you were and what you were doing that morning. I came out of the classroom at 10, 20, and I saw a group of teachers huddled up. And I thought maybe the inspector, you know, has come in from the superintendent's office, has come in to uh, inspect how the school has been run. So when I stepped up to them, they were talking about the towers burning and one has, all in fo has already fallen. I said, no, this can't be true. So I went and I called my husband. And he was crying and he said, Salman is there. I said, Salman does not work there. Salman worked at 65th Street and 1st Avenue. And this was like four miles down south. I said, Salman couldn't be there. And, and then I was crying and he said, Sal he used to call me Mane and he said, Mane, the second tower is coming down. And I found myself crying. And then I wiped my tears and I said, why am I crying? There is no one there that I know. And, he, and then a few months down the road, uh, we discovered, we were informed that that is where they found his remains by the North Tower, which was collapsing at the moment when my husband and I were talking. And I guess Salman's life was being extinguished. In that moment, we were together. And then we went searching for him. He didn't come home. Everybody was. For the first day, we were part of, okay, he is that kind of a, you know, person who would go down and help people. From childhood, he would bring home animals, nurse them, send them back into the world. You know, once we were on First Avenue in Manhattan and a car was struck in the middle of the road and two ladies were there. So he said, stop, mama, wait here, stop the car. He went and pushed that car aside. And he was the first responder. He got his license, and his mission was to become a um, physician. So for the, towards that uh, 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 achievement, he had to get few some credits, you know. So he put in voluntary hours at Jamaica Hospital. He got the f first, you know, EMT certification from the uh, fire department, and he did also the student study abroad program. 
and he became a cadet with the NYPD. All this, you know, to get into the medical school. I sent him to a parochial school, St. Cecilia's, you know. So, so that day, or that moment of 9-11, that experience, you know, what I remember, the media just flocked in. The media flocked in. Uh, Channel 2 came in within like three days, three, four days, and they stayed with us for like three, four days. We were searching for him in all the hospitals uh, in New Jersey and then the five boroughs. And we thought, Maybe he has lost his memory. Maybe he has lost his eyesight. If you could just allow us to see the patients that you have. But they, no, none, none of the hospitals allowed us to see any patients. So that, and then we decided to go to Mecca. Uh, I'm a person of very strong faith. Very strong faith. Alhamdulillah. So the eve that we were going to Mecca, that was September, in, uh, October 11. The media comes in, first the New York Post guy comes in, can I ask you a few questions? And during the conversation he, he said, oh, so Adnan, your second son, he is the president of the MSA at Binghamton. And I said, this man is not here to do me good. I said, leave my house. And then the other three journalists came in, New York Times, uh, Daily News, and New York Newsday. And I said, what brings you back to my house? And they said, there is a flyer circulating uh, you know, in the precincts looking for Salman. So we went to Mecca that night. And the next day, when I was not here in my country on the October 12th, the articles hit the newspapers. The other three were fine, but New York Post was missing or hiding. And it's stated that someone saw a, a Salman at the Midtown Tunnel at 11 a.m. The attacks were in the morning, so and the neighbors saying, we don't know that we were living, the a terrorist was living with us, so close to us, amongst us. And that experience, you know, it, it it made me, I was baffled, you know. On the one hand, here we have lost our child. We're trying to, we went searching for him in Manhattan, you know, at, at ground zero. And uh, so instead of uh, grieving, giving us the space to grieve and acknowledging, okay, there's a young man who went voluntarily, they tried to link him uh, as the 19th terrorist to the attacks. So that day, I did not only lose my child, I lost all the, the 22 years of hard work that we, you know, when an, if you, as an immigrant, when you come in, you go through the chakki, you know, the groundwork of grueling hard work. We had a store, uh, 6 a.m. to midnight, a candy store in Manhattan. And we, the, all five of us ran. The younger kids were small, but Salman, my husband and I, we ran. So all that was, you know, gone for nothing. And I lost my country, and I lost my identity. And all that was, I, all that I was left was with my identity as a Muslim. And whatever Salman did, he was a wonderful young man. He, uh, like I told you, we loved animals and children. And uh, one day he brought home a sick bird. And he went to school and the bird died. So I threw the bird away in the trash bin. And when he came back, he said, Mama, where's the bird? I said, I threw it away. What do you mean? 
I said, it's the trash bin. So he, said, he was very upset. He dug it out and brought it back. And he, he grew up with the Star Wars saga. It was a very humble, kind, compassionate man, very patriotic. Patriotic to the degree that uh, when he did not get admission in the medical school here, I said, well, why don't you go to, you know, the Caribbean, do two years over there, and then come back. He said, no, ma'am. If I become a physician, it will be on American soil. And he did not like that he could not run for the presidency because he was not born here. So all these factors, you know, uh, I asked him once, uh, Samar, what is the Star Wars saga? And he jumps back and he goes, Mama, you don't know what Star Wars saga is? You are not an American. And his license plate, that year he got yet read, Young Jedi. Why you and the young Jedi? So he, I guess he saw himself as the Jedi, you know. So coming back to the experiences that uh, we had uh, after 9-11, uh, this flyer, the, the media plays a big role, and like Richardson, Richard said, that the politicians, they take advantage of all this, you know, uh, to gain points for the elections. I remember uh, in the 2012 elections, one of the, there was a, a fundraising going on, I think in California, and someone running for the Congress said, oh, our veterans would, uh, our military will be glad to send these Muslims to their board. You know, you need to follow these things, because I followed it, it changed my life, definitely. It changed everybody's life. So, and the flyer that was circulating was not a flyer made by the uh, media. It was the flyer of the NYPD. And it was not a good flyer. It was a flyer wanted, has police ID, chemistry major, hold and detain. And so what hurts most was when your own government, the NYPD is the government. It is more powerful than the mayor's office. So when your own government casts suspicion and doubt on you, what do you do? And by the way, on so they try to find something to pin, you know, uh, the charges of that he was linked to those attacks. And then on March 20th, we were notified that his, indeed, his remains indeed were found uh, by the North Tower uh, in 34 pieces. The torso was missing. They gave us his jeans, his belt. My husband recognized his belt. Uh, one sock, one leg they said was missing. And, uh, and they found next to him his kit. He did not go leave his house with the kit, so probably I think he picked it up on his way down to the... Uh, so then he takes the train into Manhattan, the seven train, you can see the towers burning on the south. So instead of going up north, he went down to hell. And he gave this, you know, <coughs> ultimate sacrifice. And uh, his heroism is definitely acknowledged uh, in the Patriot Act. But the government didn't tell me that his name is there. The Patriot Act was signed on October 20th. Yes. And why his name was there, how it came in, I don't know. And they found his remains the last week of October, between 23rd and 26th of October. And uh, the time we were in Mecca. So coming back to the question, what do we do? Where do we go from here as a nation? You know? It's, uh, you know, Islamophobia is very real especially in New York, California, predominantly 
Muslim communities. Uh, my son, the older one, Adnan, his first name is Muhammad. He's always pulled aside. Come on in, visit our parlor into the interrogation room, even though he's with a wife and child. And uh, it's a big business into billions of dollars. And it's very detrimental to our nation, very detrimental to who we are. So what we need to do right now, like I said, the politicians exploit 9-11. As Martin Luther King said, we need to understand the urgency of the moment. It's not a joke. It's very, very extremely tough out there for the Muslims, especially the ladies who wear the hijab, especially for men who look Mideastern. I have a younger son, Zisha. He breezes through because he's, you know, he doesn't look, he looks more Italian. But the older one, you know, he looks his heritage. And as Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln said, America will never be destroyed from the outside. If we falter and lose our freedom, it will be done because we destroyed ourselves. In other words, it will come from within. And that's what we see happening right now. The Muslim ban three has been it, it, it was in, it announced, like I think, 11, 12, 3 p.m. that same day it was implemented. And the uh, Supreme Court has refused to hear arguments anymore on it. It's the law now. And at the dedication of the Cemetery of Soldiers at Gettysburg, Lincoln had said, we cannot hallow this ground because they have consecrated it far beyond our poor power to Add or detract. As concluded, he concluded it was not the dedication of the ground, but the dedication of our country. And we are once again standing at the same crossroads. Who do we want to continue as a nation? What values do we want to shine out to the world? Who we are as a nation? So the choice that we have to make right now is liberty versus oppression, religious freedom versus bigotry, Islamophobia, xenophobia, democracy versus authoritarian rule. What would you rather have? And once again, in Lincoln's words, see, he went through these experiences on a different level at the, at the Civil War. He saw the nation falling apart, and that's what's happening right now. We see the nation falling apart, and he said, we the people are the rightful masters of both Congress and courts, not to overthrow the Constitution, but to overthrow the men who pervert the Constitution. What a big statement to make. To overthrow the men who pervert the Constitution. So we are fighting for the American soul, what, what America st represents and stands. So and Salman and the other first responders transcended the barriers of race, faith, and ethnicity, and we as a nation need to do the same. In the words of Lincoln again, I keep going back to him, the philosophy of the school, of the schoolroom in one generation your philosophy of today's generation will be the philosophy of the government in the next. So the burden is on your shoulders, young people. You need to go and change the world. And in conclusion, you know, I would say, let the Statue of Liberty, which Emma Lazarus called uh, mother of all exiles, because she, you know, Give me your hurdle, masses, yearning, freedom for liberty and freedom. You know. So, so, as, so in the end conclusion, I would say, 
Salman is my strength and I am his voice. All of you make the U.S. Constitution your strength and become the voice of America and fight to regain the dignity and respect of this great nation, the land of the free and the home of the brave with liberty and justice for all. I thank you, God bless you all, and God bless the United States of America.